Welcome to Science Sci-Fi, connecting the public to science and technology through storytelling. My name is Ronald Friedman. I'm a science fiction writer. Following the release of the new 2021 Dune movie, we'll discuss one technology from that movie, Steel Suits, and evaluate how it is how this technology is compared to other technology we are currently using in space and technology we plan to use in space in the near future when we explore other celestial bodies. Stay tuned, it's going to be interesting. Dune was originally published in 1965 by Frank Herbert. It is one of the top best-selling science fiction books of all time. There was one movie that came out in 1984 by David Lynch, a miniseries that came out in 2000, and now we are all excited when the new movie was just been released this week, October 22nd. So, the story takes place primarily in the planet called Arrakis. Arrakis is a desert planet. It's the only source of spice is a special material that is used by genetically engineered people called navigators in order to travel interstellar between different uh, solar system or star systems. Uh, it's kind of a metaphor to the Middle East because in the 1960s, uh, the entire world was dependent primarily on Middle Eastern oil. And in the movie Dune, the entire universe or the galaxy is dependent on the spice that has come from only one source, from Arrakis. Uh, other there are some elements that uh, kind of symbolize the beginning of Islam, which is also a good uh, story tell, but Arrakis has one big problem. It doesn't have water. It, does, it doesn't have any oceans or sea or lake or rivers. It has a little bit of water in some storage places and in the air, uh, slight humidity, but other than that, it's a very warm, very dry, planet. Steel suits uh, were developed by the Freeman. These are the local, the native people to the planet. Uh, they're not very technologically advanced, but the suit itself is very advanced. It has a, it's based on what the, I'm talking now primarily on the movie. It has a high efficiency water filtration system. Uh, so when you go into the desert, it's, it's because it's extremely, extremely warm and there are no water supply that can, you can fill your water in between. You need to carry all the water with you. And the steel suit is designed to capture all the water that's coming up from your sweat, your breathing, uh, all the humidity that come out of your mouth or your nose when you breathe. It's going through the filtering system and then distilled back into water. It's a very efficient, uh, system. Other than that, it's also cooling the body because temperature could be extremely high on Arrakis. And, uh, as I said, recycle sweat, but also your urine, like what you we pee. And body movement provide the power supply for the suit to do all this function of cooling and water filtering. And uh, must contain a drinking tube. So as you lose liquid when you sweat or pee or whatever, you can drink the, after after it coming through the filtering system, you can drink it back and that's how you preserve the water. And if it's functioning, functioning properly, the amount of water you lose per day, it's extremely small and you can survive for many weeks, at least in terms of water, you still need an external source of food, but at least from water, you can survive for a long time with this suit. Now we're going to compare it to what we do have here on Earth. Uh, one thing we have EVA spacesuit that takes place on the International Space Station. Uh, sp typically spacesuit required additional thing that steel suit do not have, and that's a supply of oxygen, because without oxygen, we die. Also, we need to have pressure on the rockets and the external pressure is similar to what we have here on Earth, so people can survive there in terms of pressure, not in terms of water. But in space, in vacuum, you can't. So you need 
a pressurized suit, which are very difficult to do because you don't want to inflate it like a balloon, then you cannot move. So it needs to keep a fixed size of volume. Uh, so you can still uh, be flexible to move your hand, your legs, your fingers, and do some work while you are outside that space. Of course, similar to the steel suit, it needs thermal control. And the thing is that in space, there is no way to lose heat other than radiation. So there is no like cold wind that can come and cool you or you no know, water that you touch and lose or metal that you touch it and you lose heat to that metal or that. So the only thing, the only way to lose heat in space, the body heat, the, the heat the body generates it through radiation. So it's a very, very slow process. And if you are locked inside a space look like the one that you see here in the picture, you will get hot very, very quickly. So in space, surprisingly, in most cases, we need a cooling system. We either use ice or cold water. So there are all kinds of pipes that go through your uh, belly and uh, back and even through the arms and legs. And there is a pipe of cold water and just go and the water go through them, through there and cool the body. The gloves need heating because uh, space, after all, it's uh, very cold and also you can touch material. So it typically being heating using electricity and you need to wear, uh, wear warm clothes. Water and food. Typically we don't walk more than a few hours in space, so we don't carry a lot of it. If we need to lose water through urination, then an astronaut can wear something like diaper. There are no very complex system for that. If you only walk for six or eight hours in space, that's about it. Uh, it does, the space does have a drinking tube so you can drink a little bit if you are in space. And it could also have some food bars uh, so you won't be hungry. You can bring up your sugar level. Uh, Spacesuits also need communication system. They need lots and lots of power, both for the cooling and to run all the system. You also need a way to get rid of CO2, something that on a rack is just breathe out the CO2. It captures and filters out all the water, but in a rack you don't care much about carbon, so you can lose it. You, you can need something else later. Water is the most expensive, exp expensive material in a rack, so that's what it preserves. In space, when we breathe out, uh, the CO2 level in the suit will go up very, very quickly. So we have, need a mechanism, some kind of a CO2 uh, observer system that takes the CO2 out. And other than that, we need humidifier to avoid fog in the visor. So we need to take water out of the air because once we breathe, water comes out. And we want to make sure that these water are being, being taken out of the system to avoid fog. That could be catastrophic in space. The IAS has environmental control and life support system. It's called, the system is called ECLSS. There are two concepts when we design a system like this. One of them is open look. That means that all the resources are coming from Earth. And that means whenever we pee or have go to the washroom, the, all this material is going away. If we sweat, the water is going away. And we need to bring lots and lots and lots of water from Earth and oxygen, everything to make sure we have enough to survive. Closed loop is that the system is completely self-sufficient. All the materials that, we, that are wasted are being recycled by 100% and then come back in the system and can be reused. So it's a lot more complex system to set up, but it requires less supply missions. The International Space Station, uh, it's about 90% closed loop. So it's not, it still need the resupply missions, but not as much as a complete open loop. So when astronauts are in space, Basically, we take oxygen and we generate CO2. That's what come out of the mouth. Uh, we also take food, eat food, and we have solid waste later. And water, that's uh, urine and washing water, sweat, etc. 
So we need to recycle all those things. In this video, we are not going to focus on how to get rid of CO2 and break it back to oxygen and stuff like that. We are focused only on water, since it's similar to the problem we are facing on Arrakis in June. In Skylab, that's the space station that was launched in the 1970s, there was no water recycling at all. All the water came from Earth. On Apollo, uh, CMS and the shuttle, we generated water from fuel cells. So in order to generate electricity, the byproduct of hydrogen and oxygen that generate electricity was water. So it was better because we didn't need to carry water for drinking, but only hydrogen and oxygen, and then water was a byproduct. In the International Space Station, we do want to recycle as much water as possible. This is one of the heaviest material that we are in terms of volume that we need to bring to the International Space Station. And each launch is extremely expensive. So if we can recycle water, we are going to reduce by a lot the number of resupply mission that needs to go to the International Space Station. Uh, the water we have is the gray water. That's water that came from humidity in the cabin. Like when we breathe out, we increase the humidity in the air and we can filter that air and take out the water and reuse it. Hygiene water, this is the water that we use for uh, washing. I either wash the body, wash dishes, wash tool, washing tools. And this water are going into the filters and then electrolytes or for drinking. Another type of water source is urine, and that one requires more processing. What we do, we evaporate the water and take out all the solids. It's a material called barine, and dumping it into the space. But the water, which is more than 95, 98% of that, is still can be drank again or be used again. The challenge is that there is no gravity to separate gas from liquid. To process urine, Americans are using vapor compression distillation, and the Russians are using vapor diffusion distillation. These are different methods. Water recovering system, it is extremely important because it minimizes the number of flanches for bringing up supplies. If we don't need to bring water, we have a big advantage. Next, we are going to talk about different spacesuits not on Arrakis, but in some of the mission that we may explore in the next decades, perhaps even in these decades, in other uh, celestial bodies. The two examples we're going to use is one is Mars, the other one is Titan. Titan is one of the moon of Saturn. So Mars has a very thin atmosphere, so we still need to worry, similar to what we do in the, in the vacuum of space when we go out in extravascular activity outside into the space, we still need to, need to worry about pressure on Mars because the, temp the temp atmospheric pressure there is about 0.6% of what we have here on Earth. We still need to, but on Titan, for example, the atmosphere is about 1.5 of the atmospheric pressure that we have here on Earth. So we don't need to worry about pressure. So theoretically, we, we're still in oxygen, and we have to worry very, very much about uh, thermal control because it's extremely, extremely cold on Titan. The average temperature is minus 179 Celsius. On Mars, it's not as bad of a problem. I think the average temperature is minus 67 uh, degrees. Uh, but we do need to worry about pressure. Uh, we can either do something, a bulky suit similar to what we have on the I International Space Station, where the pressure is air, or we can have something, a new material that is actually very tight to the body and the material itself, the, what, the suit itself, putting enough pressure on the body to allow us to survive on Mars. Thermal control, in Mars, we need heating. We probably don't need cooling. On Titan, we most definitely need heating, lots and lots and lots of it. That means we need electricity. Electricity can come from batteries. It could come from 
similar to what we did in Apollo with fuel cells that we need to carry oxygen and hydrogen and generate electricity for heating. Uh, but Titan definitely needs lots of, of heating. Water and food, uh, we can have drinking food. I don't know if we're going to use something as advanced as steel suit in Arrakis. I don't know if we are going to operate for weeks from a space suit like this. Probably we're going to have uh, some kind of rover or a spacecraft and only operate for a few hours. Uh, we need communication system and we need power. Uh, similar to what we have in, and also need to worry about humidity so the visor will not uh, be blocked um, yeah so each planets need different requirement arrakis don't have the problem of a cold temperature it doesn't have the problem of pressure they don't worry too much in the movie about food the most scarce resource there is water it's extremely warm on arrakis so we need to worry about cooling and we need to worry about water and how to preserve the water i'm not i'm a bit iffy if body movement is enough to supply enough energy for the distillation and for the cooling i don't know according to the movie and the book it is but that's what we have so now in summary we have a spacesuit design for planets like Arrakis that have pressure like on Earth. And we are need to design different suits to other environments in space like Mars or Titan or a vacuum of space. And maybe we can develop sometimes something similar to the steel suit to walk in arid area right here on Earth, like in the middle of the, the Sahara Desert. I hope you enjoyed this presentation. If you need to contact me, this is my Twitter account, the blog. If you want to support the channel, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. I also put some link below how to find my books and you can buy them and some other stuff that I'm offering. Thank you very much and see you next week.